as the title suggests, I'm here to talk about proton detection. So before I get into that, I want to uh, just talk a little bit about our motivation. Uh, and the, one of the primary reasons we are doing what we do is so that we can uh, apply solid state NMR to all these interesting materials that are being developed by chemists and material science uh, scientists uh, continuously. For instance, uh, there have been uh, nice advances in the area of catalysis where uh, catalysts are now being uh, made in, in the form of single atoms or single sites that are grafted on these supports. Um, or on the other hand, you also have a variety of photovoltaic materials that are being constantly developed uh, to take advantage um, of uh, the solar energy. And one class of such materials is called perovskites, as you may all uh, be aware already. And uh, salt state mark can answer a lot of interesting questions um, in, the, in the field of perovskites. And yet another field is, uh, that is constantly uh, being developed is uh, porous materials such as metal organic frameworks or co uh, covalent organic frameworks, zeolites and so on. And all of these um, have a lot of um, interesting nuclei and elements uh, in them uh, that salt state NMR can uh, potentially address. So when you look at the periodic table and all the NMR active nuclei in it, um, you immediately realize that we perform salt state NMR or even NMR typically on only a handful of uh, common spin half nuclei like protons, carbon, um, fluorine, uh, N15, phosphorus, silicon, and so on, right? Uh, but most of these nuclei across the periodic table are very infrequently studied using NMR. And the primary reason for that is because most of these nuclei also have very low detection sensitivities. And this is a result of a number of reasons. Uh, it can be due to low gyromagnetic ratios or a broadening due to a variety of factors that includes uh, most commonly the quadrupolar interaction and uh, or, or the chemical shift on isotropy. Uh, so the, the reason we, uh, we need to uh, improve NMR methods is so that we can apply um, or look at all of these uh, interesting elements and nuclei across the periodic table in the materials that contain them and we need sensitive NMR methods that are very cost efficient and easy to set up so that chemists and material scientists across the world can easily apply them. Uh, please take a look at this um, uh, review on um, exotic nuclei from Professor David Bryce uh, for a lot of the recent advances. So the way we want to approach this problem is by using fast magic angle spinning NMR. Fast magic angle spinning uh, helps narrow proton line widths and this is because protons uh, in the solid state, uh, the proton NMR spectra are severely broadened due to the homonuclear dipolar couplings. Uh, and by uh, applying or performing magic angle spinning, uh, we can uh, start to partially average these uh, homonuclear dipolar couplings, which results um, in the spectra being narrowed. There are also other advantages, which includes a uh, small uh, sample mass, um, your, uh, we get much higher out of fields, which is very useful um, for exciting broad spectra uh, and so on. So fast MAS and indirect detection is not uh, by any means a new topic. It's been, uh, it has been studied for, uh, quite extensively in the last two decades. And it all started with uh, some of these experiments from um, Ishii and Tico um, who did uh, double CP experiments on N15, which is shown on the left, and carbon, which is shown on the right, where they compared uh, the sensitivity enhancements with direct detection and indirect detection. And in most of the cases that they tried, they saw uh, enhancements up to a factor three, uh, which was very promising that proton detection can be a viable approach to accelerate salt state and experiments. And the way they do these types of experiments is, uh, sort of uh, similar to a standard CPMAS experiment where you excite protons and observe the heteronuclear spin. Instead, you have a second uh, dimension where you evolve uh, the heteronucleus that you want to indirectly observe, and then you transfer the polarization back with a CP step and detect the protons. So this way, what you in fact get is a 2D uh, experiment 
where you can extract the uh, um, nucleus that you're interested in from the indirect dimension. So the sensitivity enhancement um, has been uh, uh, studied and quantified uh, in some of their articles. And uh, I just want to briefly touch upon uh, uh, what kind of enhancements you can potentially see uh, over here. So if you look at this equation, uh, this equation uh, shows the enhancement factor for an experiment uh, that, is, that is basically uh, for experiments that are performed by exciting protons and detecting protons. And what you do is you take the signal to noise of such an experiment and divide that by the signal to noise of an experiment that you perform by exciting protons and detected the expin, right? So when you do that, uh, you, this is the sort of equation you get where these Q terms are the quality factor, omega, uh, so the gammas are the gyromagnetic ratios and the Ws here are the line widths, uh, which is uh, one of the most important terms that we care about here, right? As you start spinning faster, uh, you can narrow your proton line widths. And as you do that, uh, you decrease the denominator, which increases the overall uh, sensitivity enhancement factor. And also uh, the gains in sensitivity due to proton detection can be much higher um, for lower gamma nuclei. So for instance, if you uh, take N15 as an example, um, the quality factors are approximately equal to two and uh, the ratio of gammas is uh, equal to 10 and F is the polarization transfer efficiency approximately 0.5. And if I look at the gain due to the gamma alone, it's about 30, uh, a factor 30. Uh, but if I assume uh, these sort of line widths for the nitrogen about 50 Hertz and the protons are about 500 Hertz uh, and um, you get a, a sensitivity enhancement of about three. And the, and the narrower your proton line widths uh, can be, you get potentially higher gains in sensitivity. So fast emitters in indirect detection have been uh, extensively applied, uh, particularly in the uh, biomolecular salt state in the community. Uh, there's been a number of people um, uh, who, who are working in this area. A, a lot of these uh, names are mentioned here. And uh, there's been steady effort, uh, both from academic and industry uh, to uh, push the uh, magic angle spinning frequencies so that we can potentially perform indirect detection at much faster spinning rates. Um, and, but if you still uh, look at most of these reports, uh, proton detection is typically applied to the common spin half nuclei that are found in biomolecules and uh, materials. And I have uh, mentioned a number of uh, in, uh, reviews and book chapters over here uh, that, are, uh, that capture proton detection under fast mass spangle spinning. So there's been uh, a number of reports in one particular exotic nucleus, which is N14, uh, that don't necessarily fall under the class of those common spin half nuclei that I just talked about. So N14 is a spin one isotope uh, with almost 99.6% uh, abundance, and uh, which is very promising because when people typically want to do nitrogen NMR, they think of N15, whereas N14 uh, can be a uh, potentially uh, useful nucleus to look at. The problem is it, it is a quadrupolar nucleus as when you look at the spin, it's spin one. Uh, so there are uh, the spectra uh, are broadened by um, the quadrupolar interaction, uh, which results in significantly broader lines than N15, right? And in 2006, uh, there were two independent reports from Jehang Gan and uh, Bodenhausen group where they looked at indirect detection of N14 with carbon. And after that, there's been like steady development on indirect detection of N14 uh, from a number of groups. And more recently, uh, there was this nice article from um, Ivan Hung and Jehang Gan at the National Mag Lab in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, where they kind of captured some of these experiments and uh, compared uh, uh, the relative performances. So the, the kind of experiments that people typically uh, use for an indirect detection of N14 uh, is a HMQC experiment can either perform this um, with a dipolar recoupling sequence such as SR4 to one, which is applied on the proton channel. Alternatively, uh, there's also been uh, development from Marina Caraveta, Philip Williams, and um, where they uh, developed some uh, a trapped or HMQC type experiment where the irradiation is on the N14 channel, which is just a continuous wave, simple irradiation. Um, 
And, and the third uh, sequence is uh, the one that was uh, developed from uh, Bodenhausen's group, where they did uh, some double CP sort of experiment with N14. And all of these uh, work very well for the indirect detection of N14. Uh, the DHMQC and THMQC methods have the advantage that there is no uh, spin diffusion. Uh, so you see uh, the site-specific correlations, uh, whereas in the double CP, in the back CP stuff, there is some spin diffusion. I also wanted to just point out the fact that um, in the DHMQC experiment with SR421, you typically um, um, apply the RF power that corresponds to the second order rotary resonance uh, on the proton channel. And you do this because uh, and at the second order rotary resonance condition, uh, only the heteronuclear dipolar interactions are selectively recoupled, whereas the proton-proton homonuclear dipolar interactions are not recoupled. Um, and that's advantageous uh, for these types of experiments where you want to apply recoupling on the proton channel. And so throughout this talk, for all that sort of dipolar recoupling um, experiments, these are the conditions uh, that are used with SR421 recoupling um, under this second order uh, rotary resonance recoupling condition. So before I get into the talk, I also wanted to uh, um, attract some um, attention to uh, some of these other fantastic talks in the Global NMR Forum. Uh, from uh, Yusuke Nishiyama, who talked about uh, fast MAs and indirect detection. Um, and uh, there was a lot of focus on N14. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to look at that. Um, there was a, also several nice talks on quadrupolar nuclei, which is one class of nuclei that I will uh, that I'll be talking about today from Olivier Lafont, uh, Dave Bryce, and um, Susie Pugh from uh, Sharon Ashbrook's group. Okay. So the first class of nuclei that I'm going to talk about uh, is low gamma nuclei. So as I was just mentioning uh, before, uh, low gamma nuclei um, uh, can be uh, potentially uh, good candidates for proton detection kind of experiments. Uh, and the reason is because they're intrinsically very insensitive for direct detection, uh, just because the sensitivity of NMR just depends on uh, the gyromagnetic ratio. Uh, and if you just look at the Larmor frequencies, um, uh, when proton uh, has a Larmor frequency of 400 on a 9.4 Tesla magnet, the nuclei such as yttrium, rhodium, silver, and tungsten have Larmor frequencies even going down to 13 megahertz in the case of rhodium, right? So uh, therefore, um, proton detection could potentially be quite advantageous in these types of nuclei. If you look at the previous reports for many of these nuclei, such as in this case, yttrium, silver, and uh, tungsten that I show here on the slide, uh, they've all been performed like back in the 90s, early 90s uh, by uh, Angelica Sebald. And they, uh, the way they perform these experiments, which it, it is just a standard CPMAS uh, type of experiment, and they compared uh, the sensitivity of CPMAS with just standard excitation, one pulse excitation, right? Um, and notably, uh, what I want you to see in particular is these contact CP contact times in the experiments they're using there. For tungsten in the sample in ammonium thiotungstate, uh, they uh, they find that the TIS uh, or the CP uh, the buildup time constant is about 35.5 milliseconds, and you can see that the CP uh, in fact keeps building up up to even 100 milliseconds. And obviously, uh, this sort of buildup is very uh, T1 row depend dependent. So it really depends uh, how it can change from sample to sample. But the reason you see these uh, really long, uh, unusual uh, CP contact times is because the dipolar couplings are extremely weak uh, in this, uh, for these nuclei. And that's just because these nuclei have such a low uh, gyromagnetic ratio. And I think this is one of the primary reasons why uh, NMR of these nuclei uh, are usually not performed because you can easily damage your probes and preamplifiers um, if you start to spin lock by putting 100 watts for about 100 milliseconds or something uh, insane like that, right? Uh, as an alternative, there's been this uh, uh, really nice work from uh, Malcolm Levitt's group where they uh, develop these presto sequences for low gamma nuclei. The presto sequences, um, uh, have the advantage that the radiation scheme on the S channel is quite straightforward. It, this is just 90, 180 pulses, um, which as long as you have them calibrated, you know what pulses you're going to apply. 
and uh, the recoupling dipolar recoupling uh, symmetry based dipolar recoupling is applied on the uh, i spin which in the case that we are interested in is uh, protons and um, the uh, the disadvantage is that uh, the csa is uh, not perfectly compensated and so many times uh, relaxation times uh, in these types of experiments um, for the protons is quite short and so the struggles uh, from poorer efficiency in comparison to cp type experiments all right so for tungsten how do we start to think about uh, indirect detection so if you just do a normal direct detection experiment uh, with cpmas on ammonium thiotungstate it takes about 5 hours to get a spectrum like that uh, whereas uh, if i want to do indirect detection with a double cp type experiment um, I, i can have a potential uh, gain in sensitivity of about 100 uh, which is a motivation behind doing something like this and um, and if i uh, do this double cp experiment and acquire a 2d spectrum you can see that the protons uh, in the f2 dimension is correlated to tungsten on f1 and then i can extract a slice from the indirect dimension um, and compare that um, with the direct detected spectrum you can see that we can acquire a very high quality 2d spectra in, in about 2 hours and uh, obviously in this case we could have done it in a much shorter amount of time and the overall sensitivity gains that you see is even about a factor 200 so the factor 100 that i said um, they show here was just from the gammas alone um and um when you take into account uh, the other factors you you can get potentially higher gains in sensitivity which means there is a savings in time of about factor 40000 right so we can also do these types of indirect detection experiments with other nuclei like yttrium silver and in all of these cases the experiments that we use were the double cp type experiments right so if you want to set these up um uh, what do you have to keep in mind so the first thing to keep in mind is the choice of the cp uh, condition that that you uh, that you can potentially use so there are two types of cp conditions that you can use either the double quantum cp or the zero quantum cp so in case of the double quantum cp um i can show here in these simulations where i'm varying the proton um, rf field and watching the cp signal intensity uh, uh if uh, if you uh, fix the x rf field of, of, at about 15 kilohertz you see that you can uh, get a um, cp match at about 35 kilohertz because the mas was fixed at 50 kilohertz so 35 plus 15 is uh, equal to the mas frequency uh, you also have these higher order um, um or the uh, second side cp sideband conditions but uh, those are usually uh, inefficient compared to the n equals 1s condition but that's also something that you may want to keep in mind because depending on the t1 row in the samples that you're looking at um sometimes these conditions might also uh, work uh, pretty well so um as when you do proton detection uh, this is how your um, proton rf field profile looks like so you can either go uh, for the double quantum cp condition or the zero quantum cp condition and the way to decide is to just check the proton t1 row of your sample with just a simple 90 degree spin lock experiment at these rf fields and that will give you a good idea of uh where the t1 row is usually higher but typically uh, we see that the t1 row is um, higher at uh, larger rf fields but that is obviously very sample dependent uh, and depends on the motion in those samples so if you want to um, be convinced that proton detection um, is uh, helpful this is the slide to look at so we checked or did some of these experiments with a 4 mm rotor as well where we did direct detection cpmas uh, and uh, the sensitivities of the signal to noise per square unit of unit time in these cases for tungsten and silver was about 4 and 41 and the same uh, uh, the double cp type of experiments with uh, proton detection uh, showed with the 1.3 mm rotor gave sensitivities of 33 and 116 which means that even though we reduced the sample by a factor uh, 50 40 to 50 we see uh, absolute gains in sensitivity of factor 8 and 3 so these sort of gains are uh, sample dependent uh, and uh, they depend on the t1 to relaxation times but you can see that you know in most of these cases now we don't any more need to go around asking our organometallic chemistry collaborators for 100 milligrams of sample uh, as long as you have like 5 to 10 milligrams of sample you can do 
um, these types of experiments. So uh, just coming to that, if we, uh, we also looked at several kind of organometallic complexes. Um, and in this case, uh, this particular complex, when we did the double CP experiment with about a nine millisecond back CP contact time, which was the effish, uh, which was the optimal CP contact time in this particular sample, we uh, were intrigued to see that uh, the proton spectrum, uh, uh, the proton projection in the 2D spectrum basically just resembled the 1D uh, proton spin echo spectrum. And the reason this is happening is because there's just uh, a lot of spin diffusion during the back CP step. Um, and because of the relay, um, you, um, you see the very similar uh, signal intensities as the 1D proton spectrum. And the way to get around that problem, which has been quite extensively done in the literature, this is how people typically do this, right? So you use a short back CP contact time to avoid spin diffusion. And when you do that, you can start to extract more uh, more pseudo quantitative uh, um, uh, spatial proximities. So in this case, by going to a shorter CP contact time, we can tell that uh, this SIH peak at about four ppm is the one that's closest to the yttrium, uh, which is very consistent with what we were expecting to see because in this structure, there are these secondary bonding interactions that bring these protons uh, close in space to this yttrium. Now, when we move on to another compound, this rhodium complex, uh, which has a directly attached proton. So we really only expect to see that proton come in um, when we use um, um, optimal contact times or even slightly shorter contact times. But in this case, uh, we still observe the relay correlation uh, from the proton at about negative 14 ppm, which is where this metal hydride uh, appears at. Um, and there's spin diffusion to some of these uh, other uh, um, metal groups and the, the other nearby protons. So the way we got around this problem at that time was that uh, we tried to do a double dr kind of experiment. Uh, the dr experiment essentially allows you to do the same sort of thing as you're doing with CP, right? So there's a polarization transfer from protons to the X spin uh, and then you flip back the, uh, the magnetization, saturate all the proton spins, you evolve in T1 uh, where you get this rhodium dimension and then you do the polarization transfer back again to protons for detection. So it's the same sort of uh, idea, except that uh, the, we use SR4 to one dipolar recoupling. Um, and that when we use this, as I mentioned before, uh, you, we don't, there's no proton proton spin diffusion during uh, uh, the recoupling itself and therefore there is no uh, relay correlations. So we can focus all of that signal intensity into the peak that we actually care about. Um, and therefore the overall sensitivity in the rhodium dimension, as you can see is enhanced from by a factor of four. Uh, and this was uh, very useful for us. Um, if you look at the paper, we went on to measure some J couplings and so on. So uh, then we realized that this was a problem, uh, especially for these low gamma nuclei um, and in the literature, uh, the standard method that's used to suppress spin diffusion is obviously uh, LGCP. Um, LGCP is a very well-known idea um, and um, that uh, is used to uh, get rid of spin diffusion in, uh, in spin lock pulses. And what you do is you make sure that the um, net magnetization is aligned along the magic angle or the effective uh, field is al aligned along the magic angle, which results, which makes the net magnetization align along that. And, um, and by doing that, you can apply a spin lock pulse and then suppress spin diffusion during the uh, spin lock pulse. And the way we kind of tested this was by doing this uh, uh, simple experiment where we uh, took histidine, we were spinning it at about 50 kilohertz. Um, and as you can uh, kind of see here, we selectively excited this peak at about 17 ppm, which corresponds to these uh, NH protons over here in the histidine structure. And um, we applied spin lock pulses and uh, steadily increased the duration of the spin lock pulses. So when it is a normal spin lock pulse, we saw that even after selectively exciting the pulse, selectively exciting the signal, uh, the signal kind of gets relayed to these other peaks um, over as you keep increasing the spin lock time. Whereas when you uh, do, when you apply an LG spin lock over here, we see that we can spin lock even up to 40, 50 milliseconds uh, with hardly any relay from uh, the signal, uh, the selectively excited signal. And the only decay that you're observing is just due to uh, just relaxation during that LG spin lock pulse. 
So here I also want to point out that these types of spin diffusion was observed even up to 95 kilohertz. So it's not just that we were spinning slow. We were doing these experiments at 50 kilohertz. Uh, but separately, yes, I, we've also tested these at really fast MAS frequencies. So when you do these types of double CP experiments, especially with these low gamma nuclei, this is something very important that you may want to keep in mind. So uh, just to summarize uh, the different approaches that you would potentially take to do these uh, experiments where you can suppress the spin diffusion is you can either use these short CP contact times with just a normal, you know, normal double CP or you can just stick in an LG CP block uh, over here. Alternatively, you can also just stick in a DRNF block over here. So you don't need to do a double DRNF necessarily. You can just CP forward normally and just do a DRNF back because uh, it's the back CP step after the T1 uh, that really matters when you want to suppress spin diffusion. So if we did this on uh, uh, the compound that I show here where uh, these protons that are highlighted in red are again the ones that we care about, which are really close in space to yttrium. And in this case as well, we see that when we apply LGCP and the DR inept in the back step, we can enhance the sensitivity of those protons by about a factor three, uh, which shows that we can really uh, suppress the relay uh, during that CP step. All right, so how do you choose uh, which experiment to use? Uh, whether it is CP or DRNF. So these are some uh, practical uh, uh, tips that are uh, important to keep in mind. So as I pointed out before, measuring the T1 row or the T2 relaxation time under the SR421 recoupling can be done by these types of pulse sequences and which we sort of did in many of these samples that we looked at. So the T1 row relaxation times are usually long on the order of hundreds of milliseconds, but sometimes you also encounter samples where it's only a few milliseconds long uh, in which case uh, the T2 uh, prime under the SR421 recoupling may also be comparable and provide um, similar sensitivities with DR inept or the double CP experiments. Otherwise, the double CP type of experiments are what we expect to work uh, well. Uh, but there's one caveat with the CP experiments that with these low power CP conditions, uh, your excitation bandwidth on the like channel is low. Um, so, um, whereas with the DRNF, because we're just applying square 90, 180 pulses, um, our excitation bandwidths are uh, at least twice higher with, uh, with the DRNF type of experiments. So, if you don't know where your signal is on the, um, for the X-spin, so something like a DRNF uh, might be advantageous in that sense, because if you open up a window and acquire a quick 2D spectrum, you could probably easily locate um, where the signal is. So maybe with that, I would like to uh, just quickly pause here uh, in case there are any questions before I get on to the next parts of my talk. Okay, great. Uh, so we already have one question in the q &A. It's from Gabriele. Uh, so he says, really nice, Amrit. Uh, the line with associated to the central transition of quadrupolar nuclei also reduces at high field. However, this narrowing does not happen for the outer transitions. Is there always an advantage in going higher in field or not? Yeah, By the so, way, I, sorry, I just wanted to uh, remind people that we also have uh, Aaron with us. So in case he wants also to add something, uh, please feel free, Aaron. Go ahead, Amrit. Okay, so I think if I understood the question correctly, he's talking about uh, observing uh, half integer quarter polar nuclei at higher fields. Uh, so when we do experiments with half integer quarter polar nuclei, uh, you're typically observing the central transition. So I'll talk a little bit more about this in my uh, next set, uh, in this coming section, and hopefully uh, those questions will be answered a bit more clearly. Um, so uh, the, even though the the line narrowing effect is indeed observed for the central transition, and since we only care about observing the central transition. Um, uh, going to high fields is still advantageous, even if you want to do these types of ex proton detection experiments with half integer quarter polar nuclei. I'm not sure I fully answered Gabriel's question. Uh, I may have missed it, but we could probably chat more uh, later, or hopefully it will get answered in the coming section. Uh, I had also a question. Uh, when you showed the comparisons of the direct CP with your indirect uh, detection. Uh, did you try, what were the sorts of T2 relaxations that you had for this sort of compound where you show this big improvement in sensitivity? 
And have you tried it with samples that they have actually short T2s and is indirect detection impacting when the T2s are short? Yeah, so uh, for the in the CP in that case, it's uh, for the T1 row relaxation times under the spin lock. Yes, we have come across samples where the T1 rows were extremely short. Um, like even this sample, uh, the yttrium sample, it was only seven milliseconds, um, the time constant. And as I said, the optimal contact times on the order of like tens of milliseconds, probably it requires contact times like 50 or 60, maybe even longer. Um, um, and there were some samples that we looked at where the relaxation times were even short and we couldn't really do these experiments at all. But in such cases, you also cannot really do the direct detection experiments also because uh, it's the efficiency is still you know, unfavorable. So um, maybe in such cases, it is also worth looking at the T2 under SR421. Um, if, if that is also short, then we are out of luck at that point, right? So then the sensitivity is just poor and we potentially need DNP at that point, right? Uh, we have another question from Dominic. Uh, what about non-protonated solids? Would it be possible to use proton detection on low gamma nuclei in proton free materials using DMP? Yeah, um, so uh, in proton kind of free materials, there was a, there was a paper recently from um, 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 Marek Prusky and uh, Aaron, maybe Aaron could possibly comment more on that, where they looked at um, um, surface um, uh, selective DNP experiment, um, proton detection of uh, yttrium, uh, right, Aaron? Yep, that's correct. So we did uh, proton yttrium experiments on uh, yttrium oxide. Um, so that paper came out in solid state NMR uh, last year, late last year, you can take a look at that. Um, we tried to combine proton detection with DNP and basically the conclusion of the paper was if it's got a gamma lower than N15, um, proton detection with a 1.3 millimeter rotor and DNP is worthwhile. And if your gamma is higher, you're probably better to do the directly detected DNP experiment in the larger diameter rotor. Yeah, I, I would say that's also generally true for proton detection, even under conventional false state normal conditions, right? So. Yeah, I hope that answers Dominic's question. It seems that it does. Okay, so if there are there not any more questions, we can go ahead with the rest of the talk. All right, uh, so I'll keep continuing. And in this section, I'll be talking more about half integer quadrupole nuclei. So as I uh, was just uh, saying when answering um, uh, Gabrielle's question, when you uh, do experiments with the uh, half integer quadrupoles, um, and they uh, have two types of broadening mechanisms which uh, we sort of refer to as the, uh, with the, under the perturbation theory approximation, you talk about them as the first order or the second order broadening. Um, and a lot of these have been uh, uh, discussed and covered uh, really nicely in these uh, review articles from uh, Kenjins and Ashbrook that I show here. So, but then when we do these experiments, most often um, when you're either directly observing half integer quadrupoles or even indirect performing indirect detection, you're only looking at the central transition uh, and the outer transitions, which are the satellite transitions are just uh, severely broadened. Uh, they are often on the order of megahertz uh, wide, uh, which um, makes them kind of unfavorable for detection. But there are other types of manipulation that you can do to them, uh, such as saturation or uh, partial inversion of the satellite transition so that you can enhance the polarization of, those, of the central transition. And those kind of experiments with like a double frequency sweeps or wrapped uh, RAP that was developed from Phil Granity's group, uh, those kind of experiments work very well and can easily be combined with proton detection also, as I'll show you. Uh, but in any case, um, for half a digital quarter pulse, I just wanted to show this, so uh, just uh, to kind of uh, remind uh, everybody or those of you who are not very familiar uh, with these types of NMR patterns. So this, uh, these two horns are, uh, uh, are sort of characteristic of a half a digital quarter uh, spectrum, um, un unless the um, the cylindrical symmetry um, is uh, is much uh, is closer to one, in which case there's only like one on uh, in the center. Under MAS, the line shape does narrow, but uh, you cannot narrow it uh, completely. And the reason is because the central transition uh, not only depends on spinning at the magic angle, um, 
um, um, it, there are uh, there is a second Legendre polynomial, just a fourth order Legendre polynomial, uh, which also plays a role in the broadening of the central transition. And um, you need to do double rotation NMR uh, to really uh, get an isotropic um, line shape. But in any case, since not many of us uh, do those types of experiments, uh, you're left with this intrinsic broadening. But you also have cases that are extremely broad. For example, these sort of terminal chlorines in these transition metal complexes, uh, which have a, a very wide NMR spectrum of about 1.5 megahertz. And uh, these are very challenging to acquire. Uh, and typically uh, they're performed with like CPMG detection to enhance the sensitivity um, because this is an inhomogeneously broadened spectrum. So uh, when you have a lot of these really broad spectra for half integer quarter poles, you also, again, when you go back to this sensitivity enhancement equation, you quickly realize that uh, you can, uh, proton detection will be favorable. And that's because uh, these broad uh, languages are in fact on the numerator now and your proton languages are significantly narrow and compared to some of these uh, broader languages. Uh, and in this essay of this article, we've also talked a lot about uh, potential sensitivity gains from different, uh, for these half digital quadrupolar nuclei. So then right away, should we do a CP kind of experiment? Uh, the answer is no. And the reason is because uh, double CP or even CP in general is very tough with half digital quadrupolar nuclei and uh, works very poorly and not really well with uh, higher CQ um, uh, uh, sites. And the reason is because just spin locking under MAS is a very challenging uh, thing for these types of nuclei. Um, and these are some um, uh, articles that you could look at um, for uh, thinking more about this. So with that, the kind of methods that you have is uh, the symmetry-based recouple, uh, recoupling uh, experiments. So you can either do a HMQC or a HSQC or an inept. Those are types of the experiments you can do. So in this case, uh, this uh, HM, dipolar HMQC experiment uh, can be a very advantageous experiment. Uh, you're exciting protons, you're detecting protons. So you're getting the high polarization from protons and you're also benefiting from proton detection. And um, during the dipolar recoupling time, you can also like pump on the satellites um, and uh, when you do that, uh, you can uh, accelerate these, uh, the polarization transfer steps and also enhance sensitivity in the process. So the second type of experiment that you can do is uh, DR uh, And both of these experiments have been like uh, very well studied uh, and reported from uh, Jean-Paul Amaro's group uh, in some of these articles. Uh, and with the DR there is uh, an advantage for half integer quadrupolar nuclei because uh, even though you're doing proton detection, uh, you start from exciting the X spins. And uh, the reason this is advantageous for half integer quadrupolar nuclei is because typically these nuclei have short T1s. This is not a general statement. Um, there are many samples where you may often encounter very long T1s even for half integer quadrupolar nuclei. Uh, but especially when the quadrupolar interaction is large, uh, you, this, is, uh, you, this is something that you often encounter. So, uh, but that, that means that you can recycle fast and just do a lot of scans uh, very quickly with these types of experiments. You can also uh, do the RAPT uh, to pre-polarize the expense uh, before you excite the central transition. And that is, uh, that can be easily done. Uh, the third uh, important advantage with the DR inept is that you can avoid T1 noise completely by simply saturating protons completely before you excite your expense. This, this sort of thing is difficult to do in the HMQC uh, and you rely on phase cycling to cancel T1 noise, which is a very well-known problem. And I will talk about uh, how we have addressed some of these issues. So which experiment should you choose when it comes to the DHMQC or DRNF and how should you go about thinking, uh, thinking uh, how to do these experiments? So if you quickly, uh, if you're able to measure the proton T1s uh, and the XT1s, uh, you uh, can see that in this sample that we looked at, which is gallium ACAC, um, the proton T1 was quite long, about 30 seconds, and the gallium T1 was very short in comparison, about 0.1 seconds. So right away, the HMQC uh, was just intrinsically very insensitive, just because we just had to wait so long between scans, uh, and to get this 2D spectrum, it took about five hours, whereas the DRNF we could get in a matter of minutes. And you can see that we have the nice um, quadrupolar pattern, second order pattern in the indirect dimension for gallium. 
But there is another way you can do these types of experiments. You can also do a HMQC, uh, but you can excite the X pin. Um, and uh, before exciting the X pin, you can again apply wrapped um, because it's a quadrupolar nucleus. And the recoupling is applied on the uh, indirect spin in this case, which is the protons. And here I compare the sensitivities of these three types of experiments. And we see that uh, the gallium detected HMQC uh, comes uh, second, whereas the DR inept is still advantageous. And this is because we are doing again proton detection, um, which uh, is uh, the experiment is being benefited from proton detection. So you can also potentially combine CPMG detection to boost sensitivity further. And in such cases, um, if you uh, then uh, CPMG detection uh, can become potentially competitive uh, with the gains you can get with proton detection. But obviously all of these are very sample dependent and uh, you would have to get an idea of how long is your T2 prime under the CPMG train. Uh, does CPMG work well? Uh, if it does, then you could potentially do this sort of experiment uh, with the CPMG uh, acquisition. If that doesn't work, you would potentially do a DRN kind of experiment. On the other hand, if your sample does have a short proton T1, then the HMQC might be the way to go. So uh, we uh, tried some DRN experiments on a 4% um, oxygen label histidine sample uh, in, this, in this 2017 article. And if we just do a standard CPMG, which took about eight hours, uh, there are two O17 sites like right on top of each other. Uh, they're not resolved at uh, 9.4 Tesla. Whereas when we do the 2D experiment with DR inept, uh, we can uh, see from the uh, neutron structure that the two NH uh, protons are correlated or they are close in space to different oxygens. And that's advantageous because then we can simply go to a 2D and extract those uh, slices from the indirect dimension and fit that to those respective uh, O17 uh, parameters. Uh, and uh, there is another paper from our group by my colleague Scott Carnahan, who has uh, also studied a number of other compounds um, uh, and, uh, for proton detection of O17. So I would please take a look at this article if you're more interested in this. So uh, for uh, the HMQC, as I said, in, uh, HMQC can be potentially very favorable because I'm exciting and detecting protons. But the problem often is that just T1 noise is uh, so high, as you can see in this uh, proton uh, chlorine head call. So we have recently come up with this um, modified pulse sequence, which we call a stone DHMQC, which is just T1 noise eliminated HMQC. So the way we get around this problem is by uh, splitting the recoupling into two, as you can see with the simultaneous 180 pulses on both sides. Uh, that's the first thing we do. And the reason we do that is because um, the recoupling under the recoupling, if there is a, even a slight MAS instability of a few Hertz, uh, the proton CSA is not properly refocused by this 180 pulse. Uh, just maybe want to quickly point out that the proton CSA is recoupled or reintroduced at the same time as the heteronuclear dipolar interaction. So that needs to be properly refocused uh, if you want to avoid T1 noise. And by applying or the, rather splitting the recoupling into two, we can do that. Uh, and secondly, what we do is that uh, by applying this sort of simultaneous 180, we can also separate the correlated and uncorrelated components uh, uh, by 90 degrees. So what that means is the spins that are coupled to the X spin are 90 degrees orthogonal to those proton spins that are not seeing any 35 CL spins. Uh, and therefore, then what we can do is we can just flip back those protons uh, that are not going to participate in the experiment. Uh, and those are just flipped back to Z. And then we can just continue with our HMQC uh, experiment. And with that, you see that we can completely get rid of T1 noise in this case and enhance sensitivity by word of factor two uh, or even three with some other tricks that we can potentially do. And again, the reason uh, this sort of experiment works uh, is because of MAS uh, uh, or rather the T1 noise is because of MAS instability and uh, we tested this with some uh, Simpson simulations and some um, um, uh, and some Monte Carlo uh, type of simulations that we did. Uh, for more details, please check out this article. Uh, so with HMQC, the signal to noise just drops rapidly uh, as the sigma MAS or deviation from the ideal MAS frequency uh, gets even to like four or six Hertz, as you can see here. And it only becomes worse as you increase the proton CSA. 
uh, which means at high field, these types of experiments are all the more challenging if your proton CSA is really high. Whereas with the tone DHMQC type of experiments, uh, they're much more robust. Um, and uh, even at higher CSA values, uh, there is a, there is a um, there's significant robustness uh, for, towards MAS and stability, which means that we can get much higher gains in signal to noise uh, above or even up to a factor uh, five to even potentially 10 as your MAS and stability becomes worse and so on. So we tested this on a, on a sort of a, a model case. I know we are talking about half a digit quarter polynuclei, but this is more a proof of demonstration to show that um, tone DHMQC works well on natural abundance proton carbon, right? So carbon is only 1% abundant. So there are 99% protons in a, in a natural abundance sample that don't see a 13C spin. And all of these must be canceled successfully uh, in, the, in the HMQC experiment uh, if you want to observe a uh, 2D spectrum without any T1 noise. And to do that uh, with the tone sequence, you see that you can get rid of T1 noise uh, completely. Whereas in a normal DHMQC, there's still a significant amount of T1 noise. So we also did this sort of thing with the 20% O17 label f alanine sample, where we again saw that there was a significant amount of T1 noise in a normal HMQC, which we could then get rid of with the tone DHMQC sequence. So we also wanted to kind of push this a little bit further and test if we could look at many of these exotic low gamma quadrupolar nuclei uh, spins. So if you look at that part of the um, NMR um, isotope table, there are many uh, interesting nuclei um, in you know, like titanium, zinc, magnesium, potassium, and so on, uh, which we could potentially uh, uh, apply proton detection to. So in this case, we were interested in looking at these layered double hydroxides, um, um, which uh, whose uh, like the uh, structure was studied extensively by Claire Gray's group. And in these types of materials, uh, the magnesium that are present here uh, have only a natural abundance of, the 25 mg has only a natural abundance of 10%. Um, and so when we did these 2D experiments with tone DHMQC, we did uh, both proton magnesium and proton aluminum. And with that, we were also able to confirm that uh, there is an even mixing of mg and uh, al in these types of materials. Um, so that's uh, advantages uh, that proton detection can potentially open um, so if you also have half a digit quarter poles uh, that have a much broader line width than uh, what your, the frequency of your MAS, uh, you're going to um, have an overlapping series of sidebands. So normally when these types of um, uh, cases occur, people prefer to do static uh, uh, NMR experiments as I show here with, with CPMG, uh, but you can still do uh, or observe these under MAS and also potentially do uh, 2D uh, DHMQC or DRNF type of experiments uh, under fast MAS. Um, and you can also um, um, fit the pattern um, as I kind of show here on the right, which allows us to extract um, uh, definite information about the local environments in these kind of samples. All right, so with that, I'm going to uh, quickly jump onto the last part of my talk. Uh, which involves high Z or uh, uh, often like heavy spin half nuclei. So in the case of um, high Z spin half nuclei, um, uh, these are very heavy metals and they exhibit very high chemical shift and isotropy of several thousand ppm, uh, especially when they're in samples where the spherical symmetry is very low. So because of such a high CSA, uh, your overall NMR sensitivity is very poor uh, but uh, as you can see, some of these examples here from the literature uh, in samples uh, that are, uh, for example, square planar, you have a very high CSA, whereas when the symmetry is octahedral, uh, then the CSA just collapses and you get more sharper signals. Um, so uh, these are uh, typically studied under uh, low magnetic fields because CSA scales with applied field and just high magnetic fields are just unfavorable uh, for uh, square planar complexes, for example. So uh, people have looked at a number of these types of nuclei uh, with direct excitation, one pulse excitation. Um, there's been like CPMG type of methods uh, that um, which was originally uh, developed for quadrupolar nuclei by Nielsen and coworkers, which was then later uh, developed and applied for a number of these types of uh, nuclei by uh, Rob Shurko's group. Uh, you, so the, you can, they perform some CP CPMG um, uh, experiments 
uh, in this case for this uh, leg compound, which is about 350 kilohertz wide. Or uh, if you have patterns that are much wider in this case, show here about more than 900, close to a megahertz wide, um, you can uh, apply Bush CPMG kind of experiments, uh, which was, uh, 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 which which has these adiabatic Wurst pulses, um, which have much broader excitation bandwidths than standard uh, square pulses, and even in, even when you use Wurst pulses many times, you have to like step the frequency, acquire multiple uh, spectra at different transmitter frequencies, uh, and uh, even with all of these tricks, the overall sensitivity is quite low, and you need to perform these experiments with larger diameter rotors uh, to um, enable um, rapid acquisition. So there's uh, other experiments that were developed by uh, Rob Shurko's group, which uh, use adiabatic CP steps uh, in collaboration with Lucio Friedman. Um, and they can also uh, do that to accelerate these experiments uh, further, uh, like in this case, uh, for this in case of platinum, but you still need to do frequency step acquisition um, in many of these uh, cases. So, so if you look at this example uh, for cisplatin by using some of these methods, uh, the pattern is about 750 kilohertz across. Uh, you need to, uh, the, the pattern was acquired in about 11 pieces by frequency stepping uh, with Bush CPMG. Um, and uh, it took about nine hours to do this, right? So the overall sensitivity is uh, still quite poor. And in, a, and in a sample like cisplatin, the platinum weight percent is about 65 weight percent. So if, if we are really interested in looking um, at samples where the metal concentration is quite low, like uh, catalysts, um, um, we uh, often encounter weight loadings on the order of a few percent or even sub 1%. And uh, these sort of met methods just become quickly challenging or rather uh, impossible uh, to do. Um, so even with DNP, um, it's quite challenging uh, to do some of these experiments. Um, um, unless you have uh, significantly high enhancements under static conditions, which is not often the case. So how can we potentially use fast MAS uh, for these types of experiments? So when you spin fast, uh, you break up the plat static platinum pattern into a series of sidebands. Uh, and as you start to uh, spin out the sidebands, you're focusing your signal intensity into fewer peaks, which improves the overall sensitivity. And this sort of idea was shown um, by uh, this, uh, Adam Lang and Nishiyama in this paper back in 2016. Uh, just note that you cannot really spin at one megahertz because we don't have access to that sort of technology, but that's what it would take to get an isotropic type of spectrum um, in this case for cisplatin. So in 2016, um, uh, Aaron published this paper uh, where he showed that you can do a constant time uh, DHMQC experiment and the reason this is uh, this was helpful uh, is because uh, if you want to acquire the platinum uh, pattern in the indirect dimension, you need to make sure that um, your you can uh, set the indirect spectral width uh, to a one megahertz or one point two five megahertz frequency and so on. Uh, at the same time, uh, the proton uh, spin echo period must be rotor synchronized. And in this case, by setting it to a wide constant echo duration, you can do any sort of arbitrary T one increments. Uh, during this time, and uh, that allows it, uh, that allows them uh, to set a very wide spectral width and acquire these sort of platinum sideband patterns at 50 kilohertz MAS frequency. But the problem is still that these types of constant uh, time experiments just suffer from just short T2s, and this is a general uh, problem uh, with constant time experiments. And uh, the way we got rid of that uh, more recently is by uh, uh, designing this experiment that we call as the arbitrary indirect well HMQC. And we uh, also want to mention that this sort of idea was uh, just been previously proposed uh, like by Jean-Paul Amru and co-workers. I mean, it's not quite well known or uh, very, um, uh, used often, I should say. So with the aid idea, the way you kind of think about this is you set the uh, period to about uh, two rotor cycles to start with, and you can perform any number of arbitrary T1 increments, which means I can set uh, my spectral width to a wide spectral width. Um, and, and, and then uh, you increase the echo duration and then do more T1 increments. Uh, and you can just keep going um, uh, in this sort of fashion. And when you do that, you can get the same sort of sideband manifold, um, uh, 
much faster than a constant time DHMQC experiment. And the sensitivity like we see is about like factor three higher with the eight DHMQC. Um, and so this sort of stepwise incrementation uh, just uh, reduces that sensitivity losses. So now if that is not the only problem, but we also need to get rid of T1 noise in these experiments. If we are going to um, uh, be able to fully take advantage of HMQC for these sort of wide line um, high CSA uh, patterns. And if we want to apply tone DHMQC, you immediately see that there are these two inversion pulses that are applied on the X channel. And it's not really easy to invert uh, a pattern that's uh, about a one megahertz wide, right? So you need to do uh, some kind of tricks here. And our solution to this problem was to try to use uh, these 10 H10 um, adiabatic shapes, uh, which have been used um, in these uh, uh, papers by um, Pintacuda and uh, Emsley and Gray and groups, where uh, they use these shaft pulses um, uh, for paramagnetic systems. So in this case, these shaft pulses can be very helpful. And uh, if you, we, by just optimizing the inversion efficiency, it's a function of RF field, we see that um, with a 1.3 millimeter probe, we can put about 250, 280 kilohertz RF on the platinum channel. And that gives us like about 90, 90% efficiency. And we've also done some more simulations in this article below um, where we saw that as you push the uh, sweep widths of these shapes higher, uh, you can also get inversion efficiencies uh, at uh, lower RF fields, which can be advantages. So now that we can invert uh, platinum spins, uh, um, you can also do SV dot type of experiments to measure distances. Um, and the way you do these is just like a heteronuclear spin echo experiment, except with dipolar recoupling. Um, and we applied this sort of thing on cis platin. Uh, and we saw that uh, the red curve, which was obtained with a high power 180 pulse, is like much lower in intensity compared to the um, blue curve, which was obtained with a sharp pulse. And we can fit the experimental buildup with these, uh, with Simpson simulations, which are in solid lines, uh, corresponding to those proton platinum distances in this solid. Now, we have also applied this uh, to um, a, a sample that is uh, a single site platinum site that is grafted on a surface. Uh, and we can do this experiment again in only 11.2 hours. And we can extract uh, or measure that 2.65 angstrom distance that agrees very well with DFT calculations and measure that very accurately with these types of S3 dot experiments. So now that we can invert, we can also apply these to tone DHMQC experiments that I showed you previously um, uh, for half digit quarter polar nuclei. Now we can do the same sort of thing on these uh, high CSA systems as well. So if you do a normal, even an eight DHMQC, uh, even though it's, uh, it's much better than a constant time DHMQC, there's still a significant amount of T1 noise uh, like you see here. But the tone, we can get rid of the T1 noise um, almost entirely. Um, and we see about an order of magnitude gain in sensitivity, um, which is uh, really powerful um, for these types of uh, experiments. Now, uh, in 2017, um, uh, there was this work that was led by Fred Perra uh, that we collaborated uh, with him on uh, this idea where uh, adiabatic magic angle turning was applied in the indirect dimension of the dipolar HMQC sequence. And the reason is because you, with AMAT, you can get these isotropic uh, spectra in the indirect dimension of the HMQC, which can allow us to distinguish samples with multiple platinum sites. But otherwise it's challenging with, when you see a series of sidebands to um, distinguish uh, different sites quite often. But even in these types of uh, spectra, there is a lot of T1 noise and we extended our tone uh, um, uh, ideas to uh, AMAT DHMQCs as well. And we can see that in the standard AMAT DHMQC, there's again a lot of uh, T1 noise, which we can get rid of uh, with the T1 noise elimination um, ideas that I talked about. And even in this case, we get about a factor 50 acceleration in experiment time. So interestingly, this is something we have in the article, but we can get some of these isotropic spectra in only like a few minutes, which is really powerful. Um, if you want to just know what the platinum or the, any other heavy CSA uh, spins isotropic shift is with these fast MAS experiments. So with that, I just want to conclude my talk and say that um, I've shown um, a series of fast MAS proton detection methods. 
for these different classes of nuclei. And in all of these cases, we have seen like significant sensitivity gains with these uh, experiments. And we can now perform multidimensional experiments with a lot of these exotic nuclei um, quite easily. Um, and it allows us to probe the spatial proximities between uh, nuclei in, uh, in, in a variety of material samples. Um, and I just wanna say that fast maze experiments are easy to set up. I would uh, encourage you all to try it and uh, feel free to uh, stay in touch with us or reach out to us if you have any uh, questions or if you need any help. So with that, I just wanna acknowledge uh, Aaron and uh, Aaron's group. And I would also like to acknowledge my uh, supervisor, uh, Lyndon, for giving me a chance to um, work with him as a postdoc here at IPFL. Uh, and I would be happy to uh, take any questions. Thanks a lot, Amrit, for this uh, very nice talk. So we already have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first is from Jean-Paul Amoro. So he's asking, uh, what should happen if you use an adiabatic inversion on, on half integer quadrupolar nuclei to also invert the satellite transitions in tone? Um. For wide line uh, half integer quadrupolar nuclei, uh, to start with, um, it is an interesting idea first to apply uh, uh, adiabatic inversion pulses because again, normal inversion pulses may not be able to fully invert wide line half integer quadrupolar patterns. Uh, but uh, I'm not very clear um, wh which part of the sequence he means um, by uh, inverting the satellite transitions. Aaron, do you, can you comment? Yeah, I think he means if if we were to use the replace the central transition selective pi pulse in the middle of the tone sequence with a satellite inversion pulse. But, um, but we, so, yeah. So that could be advantageous if you could do it, um, because then you would accelerate the yeah. uh, coherence transfer from proton to the quadrupolar spin. Because if you could invert the satellites, you could get a evolution of dipolar coupling to the satellite spin states, which will have dipolar coupling frequencies that are proportional to the spin quantum number of the satellite state. Yeah. And then, and then you could uh, just observe the satellite transition if you could hit it with a hard 90 pulse, for example, in the indirect dimension, um, or you could possibly use some sort of like wrap type scheme to pump the satellite over to a central transition state yeah, that's what I was about to say, right? Like that, those are the types of experiments that we have tried, uh, Jean-Paul. Um, like we have, um, even with cases where we have these square inversion pulses for half or quarter pulse, you can still do like population transfer uh, with stone. Uh, and that's something that we have shown before. Uh, so unless you're explicitly interested in observing the satellite transitions, I'm not sure how it would be. I'm not really sure which approach would be uh, more sensitive the inversion of the satellites or uh, the population transfer scheme. Yeah, I think the population transfer scheme is kind of doing that for you already, so. Yes, but yeah. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Great, uh, so another question from Dominic. Uh, could you use proton detection strategies to do fluorine detection or would the large CSAs be a problem? No, um, I'm sure uh, fluorine detection can be used. Um, can be performed. Uh, so in, even in cases where the CSA is large, if the MAS is unstable, SR421 recoupling could potentially um, be a problem, but there are a number of other uh, recoupling sequences. There are gamma encoded recoupling sequences that could be used. Uh, there's the trapped or HMQC style of experiments from uh, Zhe Hong Gan um, and Ivan Hung that could potentially be used. And I'm not saying that SR421 type experiments won't work. They'll probably still work depending on the sample uh, that you're looking at, um, even in cases where the CSA is high. As long as your MAS is fairly stable, it should work, I would imagine. Uh, then another question from Leo Gordon. Uh, for the tone DHMQC, have you tested on any less than ideal samples of mi or mixtures? What kind of challenges did you face or would you expect to face? For example, optimizing the experiment, et cetera. Yeah, um, I mean, setting up the tone DHMQC is, uh, I, I, I would say that it's uh, any more challenging than setting up a normal DHMQC. Um, in, typically in these types of samples, 
the challenge that you often encounter is, uh, well, you already, if you, if you have prior knowledge of your X channels, pulse calibrations, which is not hard to do, uh, you can use reference samples and so on. Uh, the only optimizable parameter is your recoupling duration, uh, which is what you're trying to optimize to see signal. Um, and uh, it's in fact advantageous to use tone because if you use normal DHMQC and if there is a significant amount of T1 noise, when you do these types of optimizations, if you're having a fake signal that's coming due to T1 noise, you won't really know it when you're doing your optimization until you run a 2D spectrum and you see that, oh, well, it was all T1 noise. It was not a real signal. But then if you have very re real and reproducible signal, which could be potentially ensured with these tone sequences, um, you're more likely to get more reliable optimizations of recoupling durations and therefore um, get 2D spectra that are without T1 noise. Yeah, I, I would just follow up too and say, um, I, I think the magnesium double layer hydroxide, you know, the fact that we got magnesium 25 NMR to work, that, that's not an easy nucleus. Um, and Amrit's also gotten the tone HMQC to work on um, real platinum samples where we have, you know, four weight percent platinum loading and things like that. So. Great. Um... If there aren't any other questions, or we, if we wait a bit more, uh, I just had also a quick question. When you showed the aid sequence, yeah. uh, did I understand correctly that the recoupling uh, period is uh, changing when you are increasing your increments at some point? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Does, Go ahead. Uh, does it have any sort of periodicity or some sort of um, discontinuity that is, it might be caused by, by the fact that uh, this block is actually changing over the period of the 2D experiment. So the recoupling sequence um, also changes in a normal incremented HMQC experiment, but then uh, the you have to keep in mind that it is still rotor synchronized, that echo duration is still rotor synchronized. Um, um, and if you're referring to uh, the number of rotor periods between these two yellow blocks, right? Like, is that the kind of question you're having, Penelope? Uh, yes, or maybe I misunderstood uh, the, so, the sequence. So let me just block. clarify quickly. So uh, the recoupling duration is fixed for all increments of the 2D experiment. However, the duration of the spin echo in the middle of the sequence um, you can either okay. do that constant time if you want to have uh, a rotor asynchronous T1 um, increment, or you can do this aid trick where essentially you're always trying to keep this pi pulse on the central spin echo falling in between two rotor cycles. Okay, I, I think I just misread the sequence. Yeah. Uh, okay. so, oh, and, nice. and the reason you want, to, you want to do that is if the pi pulse is um, moving as you're incrementing T1, for example, if you're using a, a period of a half rotor cycle um, and you were, were not fixing the, the timing of that pi pulse, then it would start falling at, say, half of a rotor cycle. That would start to recouple proton CSA, homonuclear and heteronuclear dipolar couplings, and things will not refocus properly. So you'll get some additional modulation. So with these constant time sequence or with this uh, aid approach, this really lets you set whatever window you want in the indirect dimension, and you don't have to worry about reintroducing modulations due to recoupling of interactions on the proton channel. 